Okay, well, let's get started. So welcome to Tree Talks. Uh, so Tree Talks is the, it's a public lecture series hosted by tree people. Uh, and we teach, root, engage, and entertain on the environment, just exactly as the acronym suggests. Our intent with this series of Tree Talks is to address a variety of environmental issues that impact our communities and each one of us, um, including low tree canopy coverage, uh, the devastating wildfires that we've seen not only in California but other parts of the world, uh, clean water as a, as a fundamental human right, the public health impacts of extreme heat, um, and today we were, are going to be talking about the future of parks and open spaces, um, especially as we see intensified development pressures, not just in Los Angeles but in many cities throughout our country. So Tree Talks um, aims to advance th these discussions to affect equitable solutions um, at the local, at the state, um, national level. And we're seeing more and more um, work that we are doing in Los Angeles truly impact where the world is going. For those of you that may be new to tree people, uh, you will love what we do. Uh, we have become the largest environmental movement here in Southern California. We are planting trees all over from the mountains to the forest, to local communities and schools and parks. Um, and all of this is driven by at least 10,000 volunteers that, uh, that come join us year after year. There's hundreds of community partners, brilliant researchers um, from top universities that are working with us, a lot of very forward thinking business partners. And we have just an incredibly passionate team uh, and board and donors. So several of you who are here with us today. So thank you to all of you for fueling our work and allowing us to do um, have impact. Uh, we're gonna begin this conversation um, with a land acknowledgement. So I would like to introduce Rudy Ortega Jr., who is tribal president of the Fernandinho Tatavium Band of Mission Indians located um, in North LA County. Um, Rudy is someone who has been at the forefront of really advocating um, for open spaces for decades and for issues of equity and justice and history and culture. So Rudy, uh, will you do us the honor uh, providing a land acknowledgement? And also once you do the land acknowledgement, maybe introduce uh, to us a bit of the work that you and the tribe are doing. Sure, thank you, Cindy, for that. Yeah, you know, we're here in Los Angeles County, so I'd like to acknowledge you know, the, the first peoples of the land, my ancestors, the Fernandino, the Tavian people, the Gabalini, the Tongva people, the Venturino, Chumash, uh, also down south with Duaneño, as well that all you know encompass LA County um, as, as well as Serrano people uh, that those are our ancestors that were on this land before others arrived and shared these spaces with us today in memory and in heart and, and through us as descendants here so what I like to do traditionally is a welcome song uh, these words uh, real simple Paco means inter kima means come and this is a song that we traditionally sing when we travel from village to village we welcome the people who travel into our village. And this is well, how we open up our events today is to welcome everybody into the event space today. So I'm going to <laughs> So it's our traditional song, welcome everybody on today's event. And as Cindy mentioned, just to, for me to acknowledge uh, my, my title and what we do, uh, I'm the tribal president of the Fernandino Tatavian Band of Mission Indians. Uh, we're the tribe of Northern Los Angeles County from San Fernando Valley, upwards up to the county line of uh, to Kern. Uh, and what we've done as a tribal nation, we're a tribe that's still pursuing federal acknowledgement. Currently, we're the only tribe uh, in this position of uh, position, uh, seeking federal acknowledgement through a document petition with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, there's other tribes that share the same status as mine as a state tribe, where we're all advocating pursuing for the justice and acknowledgement from the federal government. Through the time of history, uh, the tribe has always advocated for our land rights spaces from water to quality uh, to land space and 
much of the properties that we've had held was through Mexican land grants and US PAN. My family was a direct uh, grantors of Los Encino, which was 4,400 acres of property in the southern portion of San Fernando Valley, central southern portion of it. We lost those due to, again, political errors, uh, you know, and also uh, unjustified tax that was not supposed to be taxed to native people from the Mexican land grant from the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and also in California uh, when it was moved over. So the, you know, what the sets that were put to us, we lost those properties, the 4,400 acres to, to $9, $9 essentially of taxes that was claimed that we had to pay. Uh, my progenitors uh, was unable and did not really understand the change of law uh, that was occurring from each of the cellular colonized government of Mexican government and the US government. So from there, the tribe has been advocating um, from you know, resistance and also making sure that we move spaces into the tribe's hands from 1892 when US agent Frank Lewis came to the tribe and asked to move 20 acres of property into land trust for the tribe, which would have been the northern portion of the city of San Fernando. Um, and it was unsuccessful. Again, due to political uh, strife and politics that occurred was not able to do that. Then in 1970, my father asked for Chatsworth Reservoir and as well uh, NASA property uh, where the Rocky Dines at to move those properties into reservation that we knew that was part of a Mexican grant and as, as well as a U.S. patent. Unfortunately, the Bureau of Indian Affairs stating that our status was not clear, wasn't able to move properties. So those are things, and we continue to do till today where the tribe now has moved into more into environmental space, understanding the practices of law or that surround us so that we can easily navigate through the system as a non-recognized tribe. So we created a nonprofit called Octavia Land Conservancy so that we can now preserve our sacred spots in, in areas of practices under those spaces. So that's what we continue to do and, and definitely like to share more in the conversation. I just wanted that little introduction and I'll pass it back to Cindy. Thank you, uh, Rudy, for that just beautiful land acknowledgement uh, for continuing the traditions of native peoples um, in Los Angeles. Uh, you, your father, the tribe have really been at the forefront of keeping alive um, traditions as they relate to the environment, nature, uh, traditions that have been around for, for thousands of years. And so we thank you for your presence and for, for continuing to be truly resilient um, and, and positive in, in, in what you're doing. Um, joining us today, um, we are fortunate to have uh, Norma Edith Garcia Gonzalez, uh, who is the director of the County of Los Angeles Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, really the, the department, I think, in this country that is at the forefront um, in terms of leading on how you build and maintain, create parks and open spaces in a highly urbanized area, um, but then an area that also still has forested areas and mountain spaces and, and coastal areas. Um, and so Norma has been and is a, a leader in this. And I think you're all gonna definitely love hearing from her when she speaks um, just a, a, a true champion for, for parks and open spaces and people. Robin, um, who is the program director for the Trust for Public Land, um, one of our uh, strong partners at Tree People, a national um, environmental organization who is, has been leading parks development in uh, highly urbanized areas like Los Angeles and San Francisco and Chicago and New York, but in, in other communities um, through, throughout, throughout our country. So Robin, thank you as well for joining us today. So I just wanna go in and like, you know, this is have people wanna listen to you. So why don't we um, start off with Norma? Um, and Norma, I mean, I, I would love for you just to one, just talk about how, how you, you develop this passion um, for parks and open space and, and people and how you, you bring that into the work that you're doing right now and leading the efforts that LA County has um, to address parks, open spaces in all, in all communities, but especially those communities that are the most vulnerable. And thank you, Cindy. I am so honored, one, uh, to share space uh, with you, also a champion um, of environment community for, for decades. And it started off at UCLA when I used to admire uh, your work and your advocacy. So it's an honor to be here with you as well as Robin's work and Rudy's work. 
And thank you, Rudy, for the acknowledgement of our first people and, 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 and setting context to this struggle of land and the struggle of environment in our region that has, has happened for centuries in Los Angeles and Southern California, starting with the history of first people. Um, I first wanna say that I'm a daughter, very proud daughter of immigrants, um, immigrants who were farm workers. Um, and what I, what I now realize as what an incredible upbringing I had from my father, a deep appreciation for the environment, for clean water, for ensuring that um, the food that he produced was clean and organic for the earth, but also for the people who he fed, which was his family. And, and that had a very profound impact in, in as, an, as a daughter, we're growing up in the San Gabriel Valley, going to Wooden Arrows and going to Marano Beach and diving into the water with tadpoles and having that experience with nature, still memories that have this lasting impact about our connection to this natural world and this deep appreciation and respect for the natural world. Um, and I wanna say that that's fueled my, my commitment. I, I don't take for granted that I am the first woman, the first person of color to lead this incredible organization. But along with that comes deep responsibility for attribution, for, for really thinking through what this agency and this department does to really um, be inclusive um, and, and moves forward uh, knowing its history. And I, you know, like Rudy did, I just want to, you know, put context in regards to the inequities in park access across neighborhoods in Los Angeles County um, have been results of policies long-standing policies, laws, and practices that have segregated communities along racial, ethnic, and social economic lines. And it's no coincidences, a coincidence that communities that don't have their fair share in part uh, pertaining to usually black and brown communities also have their fair share of polluting land and use, uses, polluting land uses and freeways. We also know that during the pandemic, um, those same communities were devastated by, by um, not just the environment, but the lack of health and supportive services. And they were on the front lines of, of really healing and caring for, um, you know, Los Angeles County during this COVID, you know, devastation. We also know that it was these communities that were locked behind doors and behind walls, not having enough parks and open space. So for me, I think, you know, we also saw a racial reckoning um, this last year. I think for all of us that are in this space of equity, whether it's park, whether it's, you know, justice work, it's we are called to action because we have seen this deep, and we, you know, we've experienced this deep understanding of those that have been in pain and are in pain because of these policies um, and these practices and the lack of urban, uh, in, in the urban space. I also want to share a little bit about, you know, um, the Prevention Institute, which is a public health nonprofit organization, put out, I think, one of the most profound studies really linking the lack of open space and trees to life expectancy. And if you look at this map, and I want to all, you know, ask everyone, you know, go to the Prevention Institute and look at and, and review their park equity, life expectancy, and power building research synopsis. But you will see clearly that in South LA, children and families growing up in park poor communities have a less life expectancy. And that is a call to action. When you really have a, I mean, when you pause and think through that our practices is actually impacting how many years a, a black child in South LA lives, that is profound. And that should move us to our core, to, to urgency and to action. And I'm very excited to, while I also kind of share some of the things that, you know, drive this work, I also want to share that, you know, that there is a significant movement, both at the federal level, the state level, at the local level, to really make a deep impact. And so I just want to briefly state that, you know, our Congresswoman, our local Congresswoman, Nanette Diaz Barragan, um, as well as Michael Turner, um, you know, really uh, introduced a Parts, Job, and Equity Act, which will allocate $500 million 
of stimulus funding to Urban Park, a, signif a significant funding that will help to alleviate some of the issues and concerns that I just talked about. President Biden also launched and a, or signed a climate executive order to preserve 30% of US land and water by 2030. Governor Newsom also passed an executive order in California, the first state to also do a 30 by 30 executive order. So I think for the first time in such a long time, these issues both at the local state and national level are aligning. And I wanna share in Los Angeles County, we have launched the, the rural and you know the rural and regional park needs assessment. And so I wanna encourage all of you that are listening to go to LA County Park Needs, give us your input because our goal is to create a 30 by 30 initiative here in Los Angeles County that also really changes the context for conservation and really looks at also communities that have been disenfranchised or disinvested by, park, uh, by parks. I'll give you a good example. One, you know, Walnut Park is an unincorporated community in the middle of Southeast Los Angeles. While it's called Walnut Park, there is not one park in that entire unincorporated community. And so our work there has been, we've, you know, we've partnered with multiple agencies, the Rivers and Mountains Conservancy and state parks to acquire the last vacant parcel of land in that community. And that community, that 0.7 acres, small parcel of land will create a mini forest, an urban forest canopy for the community. We will capture and treat water on site. We will provide space for children to picnic, but also to kick a ball and even lay down on the grass, as well as a lot of the programming that is so critical to, you know, for the upbringing and, and the livelihood of children. And so our conservation movement in Los Angeles County, it's not about preserving that space that, that is, is two hours away. It, that's very important as well, but it's also about making sure that we provide that respite in those communities that we've disinvested for decades and decades. And so I'm very proud that I can share with you Los Angeles County Parks and Recreation. During COVID, we turned on, we activated like never before to acquire parcels in Walnut Park, in Florence Firestone, in communities like Westmont who have zero parks. Westmont, uh, African-American community, at one point, one of the most dangerous unincorporated community in Los Angeles County. And we've acquired a parcel on the corner to create a park. We're investing in Little Rock, a community in North, Los in North County, where when people were segregated, or you know, African-American communities weren't allowed to buy homes in South LA, they migrated to North Los Angeles County and we're making deep investments so that those communities with a long history, you know, cultural history have also parks. And lastly, I wanna say that, you know, I'm really excited to partner with Rudy. Um, for, there's been a long history of LA County Parks partnering with our, uh, uh, you know, our native communities to, to think through about conservation work. And I'm very excited that making sure that we do, you know, that we engage in preservation work that also, you know, is about preserving cultural history in Los Angeles County so that these sacred spaces are, are available for communities to heal and to, to acknowledge our history. So that is a little bit about, um, you know, I think the deep importance of this work but also the momentum that is happening in Los Angeles County to really bring forth the platform of park equity um, in Los Angeles County. Thank you for that, Norma. I mean, and to all the you know 150 plus um, people that are with us today, many of you are connected to tree people, um, either as volunteers or as I said, our, our donors or just supporters and others joining us um, you know, from across, across the country, British Columbia, I saw too, in Vancouver. Um, what Norma is doing as our leader in LA County is truly uh, transformative. Uh, and we, we're leading, as she's saying, with, with like looking at climate impacts on people, extreme heat, lack of, lack of, of, of open space, long-term systemic you know, injustices that exist, um, partnerships with communities, um, and this deep, deep, like just um, approach, Norma, that you bring where it's focused on 
humans and people and saving lives, as you said, because people literally have a lower life expectancy because they live in certain communities that are not green, that don't have open spaces. And a lot of those realities, as you said, it became even more real um, during this, uh, during the pandemic. So uh, Robin, I wanna go to you because you, um, Trust for Public Land has been um, on, the, on the ground implementing with Norma and other partners in, in not just LA County, but other cities, these a park equity and building parks in the right places. So can you talk about the work that TPL is doing and that you're doing to address these exact issues that Norma just, just laid out? Um, because I think a lot of us are, we want to do more. I know our tree people base wants to do more. We wanna be engaged. And so what, what can we do to help with those, with those efforts to build more parks um, in the communities that most need them? Uh, well, thank you. And I, I, I just wanna echo the gratitude for being here today with all of the folks on the panel. I feel um, quite humbled and really pleased to just be here um, and sharing the space with you. And of course, Rudy, thank you so much for your land acknowledgement to kick us off and sort of center the conversation here. Um, so a little bit about the Trust for Public Land. So, um, and this I think ties in really nicely with what Norma was just saying, our mission is land for people, really recognizing that without access to open space, right? There's, we don't thrive. Um, there are many things people need in life to thrive. They need access to jobs, they need access to housing, um, they need access to food, and they also need access to open space. And I think, you know, as been stated, we saw during the pandemic that when you don't have that, that access, as many people don't, um, there are real repercussions. We saw, you know, mental health decline, we saw physical health decline, we saw test scores decline. You know, there's so many things that happen when people do not have access to open space. And so that's the work that I have the great fortune of, of leading in Los Angeles. And I work with a team of partners who are passionate about open space as a social justice, environmental justice issue. Um, and that we, we, uh, we, we think about it again, always from the human perspective, how are we gonna support residents? In community. Um, we do a number of things, right? We build parks in communities, low-income communities of color, communities who have historically been left out of the process, communities that have been redlined, um, and working with communities to build those parks. Um, we're also doing land acquisition. And then to what Norma was stating before about supporting legislation, um, you know, that is really critical to this work moving forward. And the Parks, Jobs, and Equity, Equity Act that came out through the federal government is one of one of the pieces of legislation that we've supported on, and is um, a really incredible opportunity to really close the gap, the equity gap, and access to open space. Um, in terms of how we approach uh, park development, um, we think about it as I've stated from the human perspective. How can we support residents? What are the many ways that we can support residents? How can we look beyond, you know, just the, the perimeter of the park, right? We don't, our work doesn't stop when, you know, we get to the sidewalk, right? Because we understand the power of parks, that they are transformative in a community. And so how can we extend that transformation, that support, that uh, multi-benefit that comes from having access to open space? How can we support to extend that throughout the community? And so that's where it comes in our, uh, our partnerships with folks that work in the affordable housing space, work in workforce development, um, that work in governmental spaces. That's how you know, we, we bring partners to the table because we really want to extend all of the benefits of access to open space. Um, the last thing that I'll say is that um, you, to answer your question about um, how can people support, I think it's a, it's a tricky one, but I think, you know, activism comes in many forms. There are folks who, uh, your volunteers that are planting trees, um, that's activism, that's how you can support. There are folks who are volunteering in community centers. There are folks who are supporting uh, with education, environmental education. Um, and also, of course, supporting when you vote. Um, I think that is, you know, 100%. We saw with the passage of Measure A, uh, which is so critical and important to closing the equity gap in LA County, residents came out and they voted. They, their voices were heard and they voted. And it's, it's support and um, passion from community like that that I think that we are going to be able to see more park development through LA County. 
Fantastic. I know people are already asking in the chat, right, ways that they could get involved. And so, you know, anybody that wants to get involved, like, please stay connected with us. And we're going to be helping Norma and Robin, you know, Trust for Public Land and other partners as they're building parks or maintaining parks and greening parks. So um, we want all of you that are interested in being involved to stay involved. Rudy, I want to go to you um, because, you know, our, I know a lot of people here are here because they also they want to see those parks in their neighborhoods or their open space in their neighborhoods and how do you go about doing it you you just gave the story right of the how the tribe um you know 100 plus years ago everything was taken from the tribe you had nothing right. nine dollars right and now you have actually started a land trust and you really have taken things into your own hands and you're out there in the process of acquiring lands and in the city of San Fernando, you are actually maintaining uh, a, a park named after your dad, Rudy Ortega Sr. Tell us how you have done that. And, and because you're such an inspiration to a lot of us. Um, and, and again, as I said, resilience, the resilience that we see from tribal communities is just so incredible. So can you just talk about how, how the tribe is doing it and then how uh, those of us that are interested in helping more of the tribal First Nation communities, what can what can we do to, to, to help with your efforts? Oh, yeah, thank you. And, you know, the stories that Norma and, and you know, and Robin had mentioned and those and yourself, Cindy, is what brought the tribe forward to work in the communities that we're in. You know, our history is that pretty, it's horrific actually, you know, where, there's 158 registered villages at Mission San Fernando. Out of 158 of those, only 26 survive. And out of those 26 villages, there's only three lineages enrolled in my tribe. So that's a huge decline in the population. That's due to a lot of change, culture change, right, to our tribal community. And so, you know, when we go from activating and, and being an activist, which my father was out there in the community, and, and myself and many others, that brings the voice out and say, hey, you know what, we got to tell the truth. But besides telling the truth and raising your voice, there's action needs to come with that. And with those actions comes collaboration and partnership and friendships and understanding to sit at the table and have an open dialogue. And Cindy, remember when you were at City Council of San Fernando, when we approached you and we talked about the history of the two and a half acres where now it's Rudy Senior Park. So today, you know, after years of discussing and talking about it, the park became a reality in 2009, just months before my father passed. And it was City Council of San Fernando that felt in their heart to rename that after my father. And with that, the city signed an MOU with the tribe to have a co-management. And I believe that was the first co-management in the San Fernando Valley um, that was in existence first for the city of San Fernando where we go from the history of San Fernando, where we were evicted out by the order of the county sheriffs as native people, to now being welcomed back in, into the efforts and leadership like Cindy and the openness of dialogue. And that's, I think that's what really brought the tribe forward is understanding, as I mentioned earlier, understanding, educating ourselves and re-educating ourselves and how the system and the laws that are being in place. So we had to become you know, intuitive to how that was working out and, and, and the way that we're not fully recognized, how we can man maneuver ourselves in that. And that's why we created the Tavia Land Conservancy. But besides that, we also have our nonprofit, it's called Puku Coaching Community Services, that provides a lot of programming. And one of the programs that we, pro we provide is, uh, you know, uh, pass to state parks, introducing the urban children to go out to the state parks, open spaces, because a lot of them don't have that transportation. And, and right now the tribe actually does have a, a permit T with Angeles Forest to manage 15 acres of property in Angeles Forest, which is called Har Montgomery Community Center. So those are, those are the relationships that we change over time, talking to the people, you know, talking to folks that were open-minded and willing to come and have the conversation really, you know, that's what made the change because there are those old set mindsets, right? That, from 100 years ago, it's just inherently, they have come to the table, I've seen them, they're still there, they're still in the capital. You know, I still talk to a few folks, but what makes me more pleasing is that now we have great leaders, like Senator Ben Allen, you know, and Henry Stern, Senator, you know, Senator Stern, and many others who now champion an open space. And when we go speak to them as a tribe, they're, they're willing to listen, and that's what has changed. So really, you know, I think the tribe has taken that relationship approach, but also to the understanding how more and more people today 
are now having open dialogue and conversation and, and, and bringing that forward. And that's how we were able to navigate. And so I think there was a question that said, how do folks get involved in, 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 in support? What Robin mentioned and, and, and Norma is really volunteerism. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we took off, I got to be honest, it's UCLA interns, CSUN interns, Cal State Northridge. Those students that are passionate, motivated, desire, they came in, helped us. We, we had the visionary, but they had the mindset and the tools. And, and they helped us move that envelope. I mean, without really them, their support and our tribal members, our tribal citizens and the tribe with passion, we wouldn't have gone as far as we've gone without that innovation and that youth passion to really help us navigate through the laws, understand it and, and understand how we get our organization running and moving. Um, so it's it's that relationship. So as easy as, you know, coming out, helping us build a village that we have another partnership in Rancho Comunos in Piru and Ventura County. We built the replica village. We have many students from uh, Cal Cal um, the Kenyan, the um, uh, College of the Canyons, CalArts, uh, CSUN, UCLA, all those students came out and helped us support them in that effort to build that village. And that's what we see. So, you know, I encourage folks to really visit my tribe's website. It has the links to all the different uh, organizations that the tribe has established. It's Tatavium, T A T A V I M dot US. Take a look there. And, and again, there's multiple ways. Besides finances, we enjoy the conversation with people. And, and that's our old traditional way. You know, my elders have taught me, you know, come sit down, talk to me so that now that the knowledge can be passed on. And then, and believe me, I had to sit down with the many coffees in the morning, you know, with sweet bread or something like that and hear their story. So, uh, you know, that we enjoy as well. I love what you're saying, uh, all three of you. Um, here we are in LA County, Norma, 10 million people in LA County. I can't even imagine how many hundreds, maybe thousands of parks that you oversee. But uh, for those of us that are that are from LA and maybe want to get more connected, or those of us that are from other other states or other countries, what I mean, give us some ideas. Like, how how did LA build this movement of people that were so connected? Right, you, Norma, as our, as our director of our parks, Robin, the work that you're doing with Trust for Public Land, you know, Rudy with the tribes, like us as tree people going out and organizing people. Norma, can you talk to the community engagement piece and the coalition building um, and how we come together to help those communities, as you're saying, the Walnut Parks, a Walnut Park that doesn't have a park, right? What do we do? How do we do this? Um, and how do we engage? So I want to give a little context for those that are not from Los Angeles County. Um, uh, Los Angeles County was one of the first uh, counties in the nation to actually have a park measure that was approved by the voters in 1992 and 1996. It was, it was called uh, Prop A. Prop A uh, sunsetted and that we really began a renaissance and really a coalition building around equity. Um, so and there was and there was some pit, pitfalls. So I just also want to want to acknowledge them. Uh, there was a movement to replicate Proposition A, and so there was a Proposition P that went to the ballot, and that failed. And that failed because there was not an equity coalition that really stood behind a park movement. And I think that really sent a strong message in regards to the Los Angeles County needed to put equity and park equity in the forefront of any you know, ballot measure. And that's where the work of all of the community-based organizations and thousands of community members who said, I want a park. So instead of leading with the money, we led with a park needs assessment. So we, we invested in having um, a park needs assessment in Los Angeles County that identified and looked at park needs throughout Los Angeles County it regardless if you live in an incorporated area or the 88 cities. And that entailed over 144 community meetings. We worked with community-based organizations throughout Los Angeles County to go deep and to engage. And so that was hundreds and thousands of people that were engaged in this park needs assessment. And so we heard from, I remember going out to Charter Oak. Many of you may not know where Charter Oak is, it's an unincorporated community nestled between West Covina and Azusa. And 46 skaters organized themselves from high school to attend that meeting and said, 
I have no skate park in my in my community. And so we had, you know, at Little Rock, people organized. And so our community-based organizations who were the ambassadors of this deep engagement really, you know, really engaged community to really share a vision for this next uh, proposition. And so in 2016, uh, Measure A uh, was put forth to the voters. It had a 75 approval rate, the highest any park, you know, um, park measure, and the only one that really had a park equity allocating a minimum of 30% of the funding to communities with high park needs or basically that don't have any parks. And so what I will share with you is that while we, while we created this measure, the community engagement continues. And so there is, we have required that any dollars that are expended, there must be community engagement processes. So we wanna make sure that as dollars are being put forth, are being put out into projects that both cities and communities, uh, CBOs as well as county continue to engage with the voters who passed this measure. And so I know that there's someone from Koreatown. What's also phenomenal about this funding is that there are portions of it are for competitive grant funds. And so we have a three grant applications that are due October 30th. But the significant portion of the money is per capita dollar. It's a funding allocation to cities and community and, non, and I'm sorry, and, and unincorporated communities. And so cities must engage with their local communities to identify projects for those expenditures. So getting involved and staying involved to ensure that these investments that are coming from our tax dollars are making, are making their way you know, in our communities is very, very critical. So um, there is constant opportunity for us to continue to be active um, and participate in the process of Measure A. You, Norma, thank you. Um, that's why I, I wanted you to speak to that. A lot of times people don't realize how important it is for us to continue to stay involved as community members and uh, how it's now required. If you wanna get a park in your community or have a park be maintained in your community, we have to be involved uh, because it's now required for any of those, of, of those projects to be funded as Norma just said. Engagement is important. And again, connecting with us, connecting with your nonprofits, connect, connecting with your local elected officials, reaching out to us if you want to see parks being developed in your communities or being taken care of. Uh, Robin, I want to like, um, I want you to maybe speak to what what are parks what are parks looking like these days, right? And where are parks potentially being built? And some kind of creative um, thinking that you, that you and, and I think Norma, you too have had to do in terms of finding places to put parks when there isn't land available. Um, so what is TPL? What are some, some measures or actions or recommendations or policies that, tr that Trust for Public Land is leading to ensure that everybody has the ability to have a, a park within a 10 minute walk of their, of their home? Yes, um, thank you, Cindy. Um, so, I mean, you're absolutely right. Los Angeles in particular is built out, right? I mean, and, and we're also, in the middle of a housing crisis. So it becomes complicated when you start talking about where are we gonna build open space? Um, but, you know, I think we, we're a national organization, but, you know, we gotta be scrappy. I think all of us advocates have to be scrappy sometimes, right? And, you know, so we're, we're working on properties that are what they call remnant pieces of land, things that nobody else could build anything on. You know, we're not talking about acres of parks. We talk about parks and square footage, you know? We wanna build, and create open space wherever we can, right? Because we know that people need it. And so some of the places that we look at with community are um, alleys. We've created uh, a network of green alleys in South Los Angeles and are building more. Um, these are places where we manage, you know, millions of gallons of stormwater. We replenish the aquifer. And we're also working with community to kind of reclaim these spaces that traditionally are you know, they have negative connotations. Nobody wants to go to the alley. That's the scary place, right? So let's clean them up. Let's make them accessible. Let's make them safe places for people to walk, to get to the grocery store, to get to school. Um, we look at utility lines. What can we do beneath utility lines? Um, we look at the LA River. We're building a big project in Southgate right now with the community. Um, that does happen to be acres um, because nobody for a long time thought that the river was worth anything. Um, but we're building the urban orchard in, in Southgate with the community. Um, 
And then lastly, um, and really importantly, our uh, green school yards. And, and this is a, an effort that we're working on both nationally and at the local level. Uh, we are in a fabulous collaborative with you, Cindy at Tree People and others, um, the Los Angeles Living School Yards Coalition to really think about how we're gonna go from, we understand the benefits of greening schoolyards, right? We know that there's a school in every neighborhood, right? But what happens if those asphalt yards that kids play on every day, what happens if those are actually green spaces? What happens if there's, you know, they still provide all the benefit that, that's needed for school function, but there are trees, there are shade trees, there are places for water to infiltrate, there are log seating for outdoor classrooms. Um, and what happens if we open those up to the public and make them publicly accessible, right? A million more people would have access to a green space if we opened all LAUSD campuses in Los Angeles. Um, that's a huge number. That's how we create equity. Um, and so that's an effort that we are, uh, you know, uh, standing on the great shoulders of folks at Tree People who've been working with the district for decades um, and, and really collaboratively trying to get off the ground. But again, always trying to think creatively about where we can um, support residents to create green space. Yeah, wonderful. Um, one of, the, one of the, uh, the, the questions that I kind of keep seeing in the chat a lot has to do with uh, trees and native plants and um, how we build out these spaces. And as you're talking about, Robin, that, you know, it's park corridors or, or smaller parks. Uh, Rudy, um, you are in conversations right now with the uh, Theater Pain Foundation. I know Tree People's working with you. Uh, you have relationships with the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy and others that are um, now listening to you because the, the Tatavium and, you know, First Nations and tribes, you have been working with native plants and native trees forever. It is part of the culture. So can you uh, maybe speak to those issues? A lot of our base at Tree People um, wants to see more native plants, the native, the uh, climate appropriate trees, the, the more trees. So what are some creative things that you are now working on um, with like, let's just say Theater Pain Foundation who is considered you know, the expert in native plants um, in the region? And how can people incorporate some of those, those ideas into their own neighborhoods? Yeah, no, exactly what you just said, Cindy. I mean, we're, we're working with Theater Pain, and, and, the, and the program that we're working on is seeding, is to bring more native plant species in. And the conversation that we have with Santa Monica Mountains and other agencies is bringing back plant species that have been either at a point of extinction or hasn't been in their area or region for a long time um, because they use less water. I mean, that's the biggest thing. And then we, we just saw Governor Newsom putting more restrictions on water usage. And if we have a lot of non-native plant species uh, throughout Southern California, who's just consumed so much water, it's one of our issues, right? But if we use more indigenous native plants of California that can do the same effects as a non-native species and still have a greenery area. So the conversations around with Theater Payne is bringing those seeding and Theater Payne does a fantastic job that, you know, as far as having those native plants given the training on how to maintain a garden that looks beautiful. And if you have been to Theater Payne or know what the, who they are, what they do, I encourage you to look them up and they, they do have the training and, and, and maintain. So our relationship with them is to bring that training program into Rudy Senior Park. So we can train our own staff who maintain the park and a lot of our staff members there are seniors that we give them the part-time employment so they can come out of their homes. When we talk about open space, that's the whole thing because some of these seniors are in senior living and they don't, they don't want to be trapped inside. They want to come outside and they just don't want to be outside. They want to be active outside. And so that program at the park of maintaining those plants gives them that. And so that's, that's the relationship and the programming that we have are, are actually established and continue to establish even further and speaking to other agencies like the Department of Water and Power, uh, of Los Angeles and MWD, the Metropolitan Water District as well. And saying, you know, as you're doing the landscape, even Caltrans, you know, we need to bring more of those native plant species into the areas and the open banks that they have uh, as a landscape and, and reduce much of their planning services. But the, having that seeding program there so that the tribe can also bring some of the native plants, identify some plants that are not are, are extinct or plants that the tribe uses. And it goes back again to management right and also access if more places have more plants like junkus that are basket weavers use or other plant species that are used for medicinal or dietary 
uh, products, you know, like pickly pear of other kinds, then you have more access. Then, you know, next thing you know, there's, there's all these plant species that can be used on a daily uh, and it has a beautiful garden. And so that's, that's the program that we're looking to launch with Peter Payne and the collaboration with you. Tree people uh, and, and oak trees, plant a lot of oak trees. I know that's what tree people does tremendously and does in San Fernando a lot. And we're always happy to bless the trees, uh, you know, as they sprout out through the city. Uh, so definitely oak trees are beautiful. And, uh, you know, those to us, that's our staple. You know, it's, uh, it's one of the things that we enjoy the most. Yeah, and the things that Rudy is, are, um, is talking about, we get a lot of students involved. So I know there's lots of teachers that are participating today. Um, you know, connect with us uh, so we can engage your 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 students as well to help uh, either you know the Tatavium yeah uh, in North LA County or parks across uh, across the area. Um, Norma, I want to go back to maybe see if there's a connection between what Robin said and. Um, other agencies like the school districts, right? And looking at schools as potential parks, is that something that LA County is looking at? Um, and if so, can you, can you discuss the, the, the possibilities or opportunities that Robin began to lay out on you know, schools as key areas for uh, green, for trees and parks and playgrounds? Um, I will tell you that we are, I think park agencies have, are very aggressive. And I'll tell you, um, one of the things that I first did a couple of years ago was hire a real estate agent as part of my staff. And if we were going to get serious about building parks in park poor communities, we needed to have the staff so that we can aggressively go after some of the properties. And I mentioned that Walnut Park property um, we actually were in a, in, a, in a fight with a fast food developer. And eventually um, we were able to convince the owner that it was, um, that the community and the children of Walnut Park would benefit much more from a park than a, fast, a drive-through fast food location that Walnut Park was already um, had a proliferation of. Um, but I say that to you because Part of that strategy for us is to be uh, to be creative, to innovate in regards to um, where and how we build parks, um, and really expand um, our traditional view of how parks and where they should be laid out. Um, two, uh, right now we are building two aquatic centers. It's also about, um, and both of them are in partnerships with school districts. I'm very excited about that. We know that black and brown youth are less likely to have an aquatic facility. I know, Cindy, you have a long history of championing the San Fernando Aquatic Facility, um, something that was a game changer in the San Fernando Valley. Um, and so we looked at two of the hotspots for aquatic facilities. We know that our summers are getting longer um, and we know that children are, you know, black and brown children are more likely to, to die of, you know, drowning because they don't have the skill set to learn how to swim. And so both of those aquatic facilities are in a joint use agreement with two different school districts. I have about, in Alley County Parks, we have about 24 to 25 joint use agreements. Uh, and so we have a long history of, of, of joint use with schools. Um, we're also uh, engaging, I think, as Robin mentioned, one of, one of the a joint uses with DWP, we're taking an abandoned corridor in Florence Firestone that has been a dumping location for decades. I went out there, as a matter of fact, just two weeks ago, and it was, we, and that's where it's just a dumping place. And to imagine that this will be a sanctuary and Rudy, we're putting all native plants where people from Florence Firestone who have, you know, you know, adverse, you know, health impacts will be able to walk and have respite. Um, and so we are looking at very creative ways. Um, we are acquiring corner lots. And I know that some have mentioned, we don't want to build parks in, in contaminated sites. I also want to share with you that when, when, when agencies build parks, we clean to the highest standard. So when we take an abandoned brownfield, um, I think we, I will say to you that we are healing mother earth from the toxicity of decades. And so we make sure that we remediate every inch of that land so that people 
can who are rest, you know, uh, enjoying that that green urban space are safe, but also healing the earth um, from all that we've done on that property for decades. And so we are doing as you know very very aggressive ways to really turn uh, turn uh, you know dilapidated abandoned brownfield as well as underutilized park you know school space into green uh, spaces. So I, I can share. And I think I'll share one of my, I think that, I think that uh, one of the latest uh, significant victories, if you haven't heard it in the news, LA County had the second largest landfill in the country, second largest landfill in the country. Um, and we just settled a, 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 a lock, uh, we just settled a case to uh, build a park on the Puente Hills landfill, uh, a landfill that was an environmental justice issue for communities in the Melinda La Puente area. And we will build another regional park in Los Angeles County, the first regional park to be built in over 35 years that will have over 140 acres of parkland. So we also engage, and this, this project has been a, a, a labor of love of, you know, for over a decade. Um, and so, so some of the projects are easy, but some of those projects we have to, you know, we have to, we have to be relentless about fighting for the public's interest to, to take hold of public land. And so we're very aggressive, but we're very committed to making sure that Los Angeles County um, in the next 10 years looks much more different, much more greener in black and brown communities than it does today. So uh, I think what everybody's hearing today is that we are, we're being so creative, innovative, um, Norma, through your leadership here in LA County. Everything could be a park, roofs, parks, uh, you know, the roofs or schools or parking lots or alleys, um, you name it. <laughs> so are there any, um, and, and please, uh, everybody uh, that's listening to keep asking your questions. We're trying to, we're trying to uh, answer, uh, answer the questions, but I, I love the, um, you know, the, the support in, uh, in the chat uh, for the work that, that all of you are doing. Um, and, you know, I think that the, the, this whole idea of just connecting parks also to food forests is something that keeps coming up, right? And the kids, and now we're talking about joint use. So what about like the, these urban gardens or, or, or on schools or in parks? Is that something that's going to actually begin to emerge more in Los Angeles because we haven't really seen that as much. And it, and it seems like this is something that more and more Angelinos and actually people all over the world are looking at urban farming again. Norma, you talked about your family coming from that agricultural background, right? So is this something that we're gonna see actually LA become a place um, where we actually have more of these urban food forests as people are talking about in the chat. And I will say, Sydney, I'm hoping so. Uh, we've entered, we have a longstanding partnership with in Altadena uh, with several acres. I think one of the most successful, um, not just, uh, you know, uh, urban farming uh, co-op, but also we also, uh, we also have a farmer's market. And so that produce that is produced in our parks um, is also sold so that the community of Altadena has access to healthy organic fruits and vegetables. Um, in Whittier Narrows, we have a five acre uh, uh, urban farm uh, called Earthworks and it's a partnership with the San Gabriel Valley Conservation Corps and Cultiva LA. Both organizations really focus to empowering youth through horror culture. Um, and, uh, and what's very exciting is during the pandemic, we were um, through that urban farm, we're able to feed over a thousand families in MacArthur Park and East Los Angeles through the urban farming efforts of our gardens. So um, I think that that is an opportunity also for, I think Robin, you talked about the urban orchard in South Gate. We also are, are experimenting with, you know, uh, landscaping that become fruit trees in, in parks. Um, and so, uh, so that is, an opportunity to, to really create, um, you know, more urban farming opportunities. We've also have a partnership with the lot to spot in Lenox where, where they have an urban farm on county land um, to help and cultivate uh, for the community. So I think that is a growing movement. I'm an urban farm farmer myself, short nails, dirty nails. Um, but it's also 
so part of, of our personal healing, you know, um, and our personal health. And so I'm excited for that movement. Robin or Rudy, do you want to speak to that? Or anything else? I, I noticed we have like two, two minutes left. So maybe why don't I give you each one of you to, um, the opportunity to maybe talk about anything else that you want to make sure that, um, that the over 150 people that were listening today, anything you want to, you want to make sure that you get out today before we end our tree talk. I, I just want to add on, you know, this is a wonderful conversation discussion. And, and as I mentioned, you know, just building up collaboration and partnerships and ideas and bring them forward. And I'm watching some of the chat conversation, how many people are also doing tremendous and beautiful work across the nation, across the world. I, just, I saw someone from England doing something as well. So it, it's always great, you know, so long as you have sun and some water and some dirt, you can plant anywhere, right? And you can make anything a green space. And so I just want to encourage that. Look at the native plant species from where you're from encourage that environment, that healthy living, healthy earth is a healthy, beautiful place for everybody. And that's all I just want to share on. Thanks, Rudy. And I'll just add on to that, that I think um, it's conversations like this and partnerships like these with community that really builds the best parks, right? Those are the parks that succeed. Those are the parks that thrive. Those are the parks that get used. Those are the parks that get embedded in children's memories as like a place that they went to and helped, you know, you know, guide their environmental stewardship through their life. And so um, I'm appreciative of this opportunity and really of all the community members that are on the chat talking about how they want to get involved. And so uh, look forward to more conversations and more partnerships. Um, and Cindy, Rudy, uh, Robin, it's always a pleasure to, to share space with you all. But I also, uh, I also want to, from the humanistic standpoint, I believe that parks, um, there's been so much trauma, so much pain. And Rudy mentioned it in regards to generational and, 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 and pain that I believe that, that you know, parks and open space, trees, environment have the opportunity to heal. And um, and I think that is the purposeful work that we all do, that our engagement in, in this field is about healing people and healing communities and healing the atrocities that have haunt, that continue to haunt um, our society. So this is purposeful, deep uh, work that I'm uh, very fortunate to be um, engaged in. Thank you, Norma. Yeah, and to everybody that's listening today and part of our conversations, um, you know, I do encourage you to, to stay involved, um, get connected to us um, at treepeople.org, follow us on social media, send us your email because if you wanna stay connected with the Fernandinho Tataviam tribe or with Trust for Public Land or help Norma as our fearless leader in LA County with the work that she's doing, we will connect you to them. Um, LA may seem like it's a big area, but it's really not that big when we all realize how, how, how easily we can be connected to each other and help each other and go into other areas. Like I think we should all go build that park in Walnut Park when Norma, when Norma says it's gonna get done. We will be there helping you out. Um, you know, Rudy, when the, when the Tataviam are once again beginning to uh, rightfully um, you know, steward and, and own more of the land that was, was that was yours. We will be there with you to help restore those pre precious areas. And Robin, with you helping green more schools and build more parks. And this is this is just an opportunity um, that we provide as as, as tree people um, to bring uh, our community together. There's so many opportunities, and as Norma said, this is healing, and it's it's in it's uniting. And it feels really great if you haven't already gone out um, to go get your hands, as Rudy said, in that soil and plant the tree and put the water on it. it it's just, uh, it's, it, I think this is the, the, the right time for us as, as, a, as a community, a global community to come together and, uh, and, and take care of more of our parks and open space, plant more trees and, um, and really stay united as, as a community. So thank you to everybody again uh, for participating today. We're going to be sharing this. Uh, we are going to be sharing out the uh, the tree talk from today. Um, so thank you. Have a wonderful rest of the day and uh, follow us for upcoming tree talks.